uh, marriage. Marriage. That is what brings us together today. Um, it is February, the day, the month of Valentine's, and I made a comment. I don't remember when, because I hardly remember the comment that Walt remembered at some point here recently about that and was like, Tim, did you have a series on marriage? And so I have been gifted the opportunity to come and present a series on marriage. I need you all, from young and to the oldest, to listen to me for the next three minutes before you decide whether you're going to tune me out because we're talking about marriage and something you may not care about, never think you're going to be interested in or not want to hear about, I need you to listen for three minutes because right. I'm going to make a case as to why you should listen to what's about to come over these next three weeks. Marriage is a, a I can't think of the word, a metaphor, a uh, uh, object lesson. Marriage is used as an object lesson by God, by Jesus, throughout the scriptures. From chapter 2 of Genesis 1. I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense. From chapter 2 of Genesis, <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, all the way through Revelation 22, the, the object lesson of marriage and what that is in scripture permeates the whole of it. So I contend that marriage, whether it is something we are interested in in the future, whether it's something we are in now, or whether it's something that is not a part of our lives, is something that everyone should at least understand and appreciate what it's about. Because the relationship that is marriage is not just confined to marriage necessarily. There can be great relationships and connections that happen that can simulate marriage, if you will. Take David and Jonathan, Jonathan in the Bible. Theirs was a friendship that went beyond interest, that went beyond um, commonalities. It went to covenant territory. They were connected. They were in a friendship that was going to last through thick or thin and even cause one of them to give their life up essentially for the other. Marriage is something that we should understand. Marriage is something that is throughout the scripture. So I contend today, and my intention is over the next three weeks to present through the context of marriage spiritual truths that apply to every person, All right. spiritual concepts that reply to every relationship okay. or should apply to every Christian relationship. And when I say Christian relationship, I mean any relationship that we, you, me, as a Christian has with anybody else in the world. Okay. This is not just a Christian to Christian thing. This is a Christian perspective of what friendship, of what relationship, of what co uh, covenantal commitment. Woo! <laughs> Man! My tongue is untied. I needed to go through my little morning thing. By the way, I've never had a cup of coffee since, uh, and I want to meet 2000 two on the hilltops of Costa Rica. That's probably the last cup of coffee I ever had, and I was done. Still affecting you. That's right. Still, still is flowing through my system. Um, so that is what we're going to do. So please understand, there will be marriage concepts presented. There will be things that I present that I think will help people in this room look at marriage hopefully differently, because it did for me. So that will happen. But I also am intentioning to present concepts that are spiritually inclined, that will show us how God relates to us and how we should in turn relate back to him and then out on the horizontal level to others. So that is what I'm going to do. So I need all of you to show up for the next three weeks so at the end of this you can be like, dude, nailed it, or yeah, put that one down. That's, let's just move on. So I'm gonna need you to tell me how I did at the end of this. I need to say, did I meet my goal? My goal is to present the object lesson of marriage as a relational example for all Christians okay. to everyone else. All right. So this all started when I read a book. Hey, oh, that screen's not on. This all started when I read a book. 
by Timothy Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. If you are interested in marriage in any sort of way, be it you like want to know about what marriage is, if you are single and plan to be or don't plan to be, I recommend this book. If you are single and plan to be married, I highly recommend this book. If you are married, be it for a day or be it for 70 years, was it? 45, oh, 70 years. Anyway, some, we, we celebrated something last week, some wedding anniversary, right? Congratulations. I can't remember how many, 45? 45 years. Whether you've been married for 45 years or for 45 days or for 45 minutes, right. congratulations. That's a, that's a feat, and I would also ask, why on earth are you here? Um, anyway, so enough of that. So whether you've been married, plan to be married, whether you are a young adult, whether you are a young, young adult, this book has amazing things in it. I highly recommend The Meaning of Marriage by Tim and his wife, Kathy Keller. Um, it definitely presents some scriptural ideas. So I will be pulling heavily and relying heavily on some of the concepts that are found in this book, and I just wanted to be clear up front. So I'm almost done with my series introduction here, so this will tell you if you want to be here for the next three weeks. So the next three weeks, this is what we're going to be looking at. These are the concepts that you have to look forward to. Today we're going to be looking at covenant, the promise in marriage. Next week we'll be looking at truth, the mirror in marriage, and then on February 26, I think it is, we'll be looking at choice, the power in marriage. So that is what's coming up. And remember, my one number one goal is to present the object lesson of marriage as an ideal for how we approach every relationship, whether inside or outside the context of marriage. That is it. Let's pray. Lord, as we start this journey together, I pray that you would speak through this broken vessel that you would shine out, that your words, that your spirit would translate these words, that it would encourage a hurting heart, that it would convict a proud heart, that it would uplift everyone who is a part of this message today or in the future. So Lord, that is my prayer, and I ask it knowing that weeks ago, your angels were already answering this prayer. So Lord, it's with that that I step out in faith. Amen. Amen. Whoa, not sure why that got me, but anyway. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Covenant, the promise in marriage. So to start this journey, we need to understand what covenant is. We need to understand this idea of covenant. Covenant is used throughout the Bible to describe God's interaction with his people, his chosen people, his unchosen people, and I mean that just as like Israelites and non-Israelites. He has used covenantal relationships, I'm going to contend, from eternity future and eternity past. God has been in covenant relationship. So today we're going to look at this. The everlasting covenant promises unconditional future love. Okay, this is, this is the point. The everlasting covenant promises unconditional future love. So today we are going to unpack this statement unconditional future love, the everlasting covenant. If you have your Bibles, <clears throat> we're going to just be looking at a few verses today. There's going to be tons of spirit, uh, scriptural references and allusions to scriptural things. We just won't be going up every single text because it started to feel like it was proof texting. And so I'll let you kind of ask me later about these things. But I want to start in Genesis chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, Open it up to Genesis chapter 9 because we need to test my claim of the everlasting covenant that goes both to everlasting future and goes back to everlasting past. Genesis chapter 9 is the ending of the story of the flood and it is 
actually, the sec- oftentimes I was just looking at a Bible uh, last night, maybe, I think, that had a commentary part that said Genesis chapter 9 is the first reference to covenant in the Bible. It actually is not, and I'll, I'll show you that. But here is the covenant. After the flood, after the, the waters have dried up, Noah comes out and builds, builds an alt- altar, and God says this in Genesis chapter 9, verse 13. Uh, no, verse 15, where did it go? 16, there it is. Okay, so in this text, the rainbow shall be in the cloud, God is saying to Noah. And God says, I will look on it to remember the what? To remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh. What kind of flesh? All. All flesh that is on the earth. So here at, after this first thing, this is, after the flood, this is the first mention of God's covenant for the most part. Actually, in chapter 6, verse 18, I believe it is, chapter 6, verse 18, God tells Noah that he is making, has made, will make, is establishing an, a covenant with Noah. And as you look at that, if you look at the idea of establishing a covenant in chapter 6, and you look at this concept of the everlasting covenant that God initiates at, and I don't want to say initiates, that's the wrong word, it sort of steps on what I'm trying to say. The, the covenant that God confirms again after the flood, I believe this is the first time that covenant is mentioned because this is the first time that God's judgment has been enacted in a global scale. This is the first time where a symbol of Christ, a type of Christ, has happened. The ark that Noah and his family got into, that all were invited to get into. Brought them through the depths of the deadly deluge. Ooh, I just made that up. That was good. The depths of the deadly deluge. Man! I needed to drink more coffee 20 years ago. Okay, so the, the ark brought, one more time, the ark brought Noah and his family and anyone else who wanted to be a part through the deadly, deluge. deep, deadly deluge. Oh, man, come on. All right. So in this moment, God set up a covenant because imagine being Noah. Imagine being his wife or his sons or their wives, being one of these eight people who come out of the ark into a world that is changed forever. Well, the covenant we will talk about in a minute was set up in the garden. This is the first time, this is a time again, where they need to be reminded that all is not lost. They need to be reminded that I am still with you, God says, I am with you. I am going to be with you, and I have made a covenant, and yes, it is an everlasting covenant, and it will, I will remember it, and it will hold you together. So in these next few years of your life, when you begin to repopulate the earth, understand that it is not all lost. Understand that I am still with you. So as we go back, the, I say the covenant was established earlier. Think back to Genesis chapter 2. If you want to turn there, we talked about it earlier. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. If you've ever been to a wedding, I know you have heard this verse. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So just think about it. This is that marriage moment in the garden. Adam and Eve have been created. Adam doesn't have a father to leave or a mother to leave. Um, So he was looking forward to us uh, mama's boys that were going to need to walk away from mother. Um, So in that moment, in that first marriage in the garden, a marriage covenant is initiated between Adam and his wife Eve. A promise that they will be married, that they will be joined, that they will become one organism, that they will become so connected that it's as if they are one. They will enter into that 
covenant relationship that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have. This idea of they are so close, they are considered to be one. This, this covenant relationship, it has been since forever beyond what we can imagine as a beginning that God and the Trinity have been in this covenant relationship. And so in that moment in the garden, God cannot possibly have initiated his everlasting covenant and ask Adam and Eve to do it without have already explaining to them what his covenant is. We love because he first loved. God always, a couple weeks ago or a month ago, don't know, last time I preached, I was talking about how God, the things that God is initiating, the thing that God does. So in this moment, we can look and say that God's eternal covenant, God's everlasting covenant has been since time before the beginning of time. It has been since forever that God has lived in covenant relationship. And so the idea of an everlasting covenant is so important because it permeates all other covenants that are given because they are not separate covenants for a time. They are all bits and pieces broken off, explained different, given different signs, different examples, and different sacrifices. They are all given these different things because they are all a part of one covenant that God is sharing through different people, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of those people he shares covenants with, they are all part and parcel of the everlasting covenant that God has initiated with his people. So everlasting covenant in the context of marriage is that important. We need to understand that this is the essence of what marriage is. We need to understand that this is the essence of God's relationship with us. And as Christians, we've been asked to love your neighbor as yourself. We've been asked to go into covenant relationship with those who believe or those who don't believe. We've been asked to represent Christ's covenant relationship. And it happens in marriage. All right. I did my slides different, and I don't know what's coming next. So I need to just press the button and go. So the everlasting covenant promises. I want to stop here and talk about promises. Just today, even not even a half hour ago, okay, 50 minutes ago, um, I made a promise with a little young girl. It was fantastic. And her eyes lit up. I promised it was like, She wanted to show me her dolly, and I wanted to see it, but I didn't have time, so I made her promise she would show me after church, and so wherever you are, right back there, I'm, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you and the promise we made. We love promises. I, I cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I mean, promises are huge as kids. We love promises, you know, these things that we do. You know, I, I pinky promise, you know, I, I, you know, spit promise, or whatever it is. We love promises. Promises are a thing. If you don't think that promises are a thing, go to Spotify or Amazon Music, whatever it is, and just look up love songs. And I swear, by the moon and the stars in the sky, I'll be there. These five words, I swear to you, I'll be there for you. We love promises. Promises are a thing. We like them, but why do we like giving promises? They are also a dangerous thing. Um, God talks about giving oaths, you know, giving things in the Bible, and he kind of warns against it because we need to understand that when we promise things, it changes us because promises actually help define our identity. Promises define our identity. Think of the promises of God's covenant relationship that he gives to us, calling us his children, calling us his his father, calling us his friend, calling us all of these things, bringing us into these promises that point back. We love these promises. And when we live in those promises, it defines who we are. It gives us our identity. On the days that I don't feel like it, I am a child of God. In the times that I've made mistakes, and walked away, I am a child of God because God's everlasting covenant promises. Amen. Promises are important. Check this quote out. 
th- this, is, this is good. This is C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, Mere Christianity. The idea that being in love, quote unquote being in love, is the only reason for remar- remaining married really leaves no room for marriage as a contract or a promise at all. If love is the whole thing, then the promise, I, uh, then the promise adds nothing. Typo. And if it adds nothing, then it should not be made. Promises are important. Promises define who we are because in the, in the moment when I have made a promise, I don't look to the things, my dreams to define who I am. I don't look out to the, the, what's happened, the circumstances in my life to define who I am. In a relationship, in a marriage relationship, when I look at my marriage and I wanna know who I am, I look at the promise that I made because it guides my life. I promise to love you till death do us part. I promise to love you in sick and health. I promise these things when you begin to go astray, the promise will bring you back to center. It will give you identity. Promises are important. Promises are things that tell others about who we want to be. So when we break promises, when we don't make these promises in our relationships, it will lead us down a path of being, dare I say, relationally schizophrenic. I mean, it will, it will create madness in our lives when we do not abide, when we do not live, when we do not hold fast to the promises we have made. The everlasting covenant of God promises. He has promised in our life. He has promised to be there for us. So the everlasting covenant promises Unconditional future love. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because when we make unconditional future promises, when we make a covenantal promise, when we make a promise of any sort, what we are doing is saying that in the future, I am going to be in this place. I am going to be doing this thing. I am going to be someplace. After church today, I'm going to be in the lobby because I promised. And I'm going to be looking at a dolly because I promised. That is a future relationship that I'm going to use. That is a future relationship that is going to define who I am in that moment for between me and that young child. It is a promise that I will be there. When we make a promise in the context of marriage on our wedding day or on a wedding day we are not promising that today I love you and I hope to love you in the future you are promising in that moment you are promising that in the future I will love you as much and more in the future. Because, get this, so let's look at these relationships. There's a couple of relationships I want to look at that kind of come, that help explain this. A consumer relationship or a covenant relationship. A consumer relationship would be deeds and actions performed to receive love. So think about this. This defines a dating relationship. Oh, come on now. This defines, yes, you're right, Pastor Wall, but I'm not quite going there yet. I don't want to be quite so um, whatever. I want to talk about dating relationship for a second, though. A dating relationship is a consumer relationship. I am not dogging on dating. I'm just saying that's what it is. Okay. Okay? Because we all know this. If you have ever dated somebody, you put on your best. You ask your roommate to smell your breath. And they're like, yeah, good, not great, you know, sort of a thing. You know, your, your, your girlfriend 
um, gives you advice like, sister, do not do that one thing. Because you do not want to open up the box that much to show him how crazy you are. Keep your cray-cray at home. Okay, so we, 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 in a consumer relationship, we put on a facade so that people will love us. We put on this facade of this is, this is who I would like to be in hopes that you will like to be with me. This is a consumer relationship. It happens in dating. It is a relationship that can come in and control our lives. If we remain in a consumer relationship, just think about that. You are in a constant struggle of self-promotion. You're in a constant struggle of, of marketing yourself. You're in a constant struggle of making sure that you are doing it right so that you can receive love. This happens in our spiritual lives. Okay. We, we step out of a covenant relationship with Jesus, and we say, Jesus, awesome, stay here. I'm gonna run over here for a minute, and I'm gonna do my thing, knowing that you're gonna be back there. The whole time, we're feeling weird and separated and not right, but if we have this consumer relationship, we come back saying, Lord, I promise that if, if you will just fix this problem I got myself into, I will never do this again. I promise that if, I, if, you, if you do these things, I will be different. I will, what, Lord, what do I have to do, the rich young ruler? Lord, what do I have to do to gain the kingdom? That is a consumer relationship because we're focused on what we have to do. As we talk about here often, that is the definition of pagan re religions. Performing acts to gain God's approval. That's right. That is a consumer relationship. The security is not there. There is no security. There is no foundation in a consumer relationship, a covenant relationship. Constant love produces deeds and actions. You always have to understand that the loving things that we do, the things that we, we, we want to do to make things better, we need to understand that those things are not right or wrong. We have just have to get them in the right order. We need to understand that constant love is going to produce that. I will brush my teeth, one, because I don't want them to fall out of my head, but two, because I respect Anna. I don't want her to have to wake up to dragon breath every day. You know, I'm going to do these things. You know, I'm going to try and keep some of my cray-cray around. I'm going to try and, you know, not be a Neanderthal sort of a man around here all the time. Even Notice, I'm saying all the time. Because we all know some of the time. I am, I am doing those things not to earn the love of my spouse, but doing them because I love my spouse. And so in a covenant relationship, the promise of future love means that you will be loved no matter what. Even with, your bad teeth. Amen. Even with my bad teeth. Even with my bad breath. Even with my Neanderthal mannerisms. No matter what it is I do, I, the, the covenant promise of marriage is there saying that in the future, I will love you no matter what. The only reason that is possible is because Jesus has made that same covenant relationship. That is what God's covenant relationship with us is saying. It's saying that I love you and no matter what you do, my love will remain exactly the same. It will be no more, it will be no less. It will be 100% all the time. That is the covenant relationship that God established when it was just the three of them hanging out. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That is the, re the covenant relationship that in Jeremiah we're told God established with the day and night. God established a covenant with the day and the Israelites when they are committing spiritual adultery left and right and they're doing these things, he's saying, you think you can break my covenant? You think you can break my covenant with the day and change times? You think you can do these things? No, you can't. I love you. My covenant is fast and firm, has been there since time, since before time began. That is the covenant relationship that God initiates with us. So in our marriages, 
in our earthly relationships, when we make a covenantal promise, we are giving the promise of future love. And think about that. That allows me to know that if I have a day where I make mistakes, if I have a day where I have done awful things, where I have a day where I've just been short, or whatever it is with my spouse, the, the promise of future love is there. The promise that I will love you is there. And that is covenantal love. That is what we're called to give out in marriage. Amen. So for those of us who are married, for those of us who are pondering getting married, understand that this is what we're talking about. A covenant relationship is not just intimate despite being legal. Okay? It is a relationship that is more intimate because it is legal. How often do we as Christians struggle between the legality of God's relationship with us and the love relationship that God gives with us? We, we struggle to make those connects because we think in our minds that legal is the antonym of love. Forgetting that in our marriage relationships, the legal aspect of it, the fact that I went in and signed a piece of paper when I got married to Anna, is important, and it doesn't just bind us together and force us to be together. It's the idea that I am willing to legally give up all my freedom so that in the future, I can enjoy way more freedom than I could have ever imagined. God in his law and love are synonymous. His law is the law of love. We hear that all the time, but we need to understand that. In a marriage relationship, oftentimes today the thought is, I don't need a piece of paper to tell me how much I love you. But you're cutting out, you're cutting out the security. Because you see, in the covenant relationship, the promise of future love means that I don't have to perform or keep making sure I don't make you mad enough to leave me. You are not going to leave me because you have made a covenantal promise to be there. So those of us in marriage relationships, if this is not something that you have really truly digested or, or thought about, I encourage you to think about this. This is what gives us the, I, the ability to know that we don't have to fear if we're going to one day just make our spouse so mad they're going to leave. In our spiritual relationship, we don't have to worry that one day we're going to make God so mad he's just going to leave. Right. He is committed to be there for us. God. The covenant relationship is a promise of future love. It is that promise that we will remain true, faithful, that we will remain in love, in love, that it will not be swayed by feelings, that it is a promise, a relationship that is, it is a relationship that is more intimate because it is legal. Do not miss that God's law of love is both legal and absolutely grace-oriented love at the same time. Do not miss that. Think about it this way. This is kind of a, a good example or an interesting example, I, I thought of um, the day, well, let me say it this way, my wedding day, in my marriage, my wedding day is the day that I loved Anna the least. Think about that. Your wedding day, in a marriage, when you commit to a covenantal relationship, the day you love your spouse the least will be that beautiful, glorious day when, she, when you're standing there and he's all in his tuxedo and she's in a beautiful gown. That will be the day you love your spouse the least. Because in a covenant relationship that promises future love, that love is going to grow and grow and grow and be more expressive and more expansive and more amazing than you can think of. The day that we love God the least in eternity will be the day that he comes to take us home. 
because in that covenantal relationship for all of eternity, we will be growing in love because if we're not growing deeper in love with God throughout eternity, then eternity is a stagnant, festering pool. Okay? So our love will grow deeper because it is a cov- covenantal love of the promise of future love no matter what happens. So the day we love God the least will be the day that he comes to take us home. And from that day forward, our love will continue to grow and deepen as we are in covenantal relationship with him. Amen. The covenant promise of marriage is that I will love you in the future no matter what. No matter if you have put on 20 pounds, 100 no matter if your skin falls off your face, no matter if the hair runs away from your head, um, no matter what may happen, no matter what may happen, I will love you unconditionally. That is what makes a marriage strong. That is what makes a relation, a friendship relationship strong. That is what makes our relationships with those who do not know God strong. Because no matter what that person does, we will still be there sharing God's love no matter how often they hurt us. No matter how often or what they think of us, we will be there. God's covenant relationship promises unconditional future love. We've been talking about this in the context of marriage, but I hope that you've seen that marriage in this way is just an example of what God is doing in all of our lives. In all of our lives, God has said, it doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter where you have been or if you run away. My love is constant because it is covenantal and it is the promise of future love. So, Married people, people who may want to be considering marriage. Think about that. Understand what marriage covenant commitment is. All of us, spend time reminding yourselves of what God's covenantal relationship with us means. It means that as they were stoning as they were whipping Jesus. He did not look down and say, you filthy animals. He looked down and said, Father, forgive them. He looked down and saw, he looked down and saw his children and said, I don't care what you are doing to me now or what you have done or what you'll do in the future. I am committed because I am in a covenantal relationship with you. This is what our relationship should be. Lord, today, we've taken a moment to remind ourselves of what you went through so that you could spend eternity with us connected in covenantal, face-to-face relationship. We've also reminded ourselves of the commitments that we need to make to others. So Lord, I pray that you will work in us and that you will work through us to bring us as better reflectors, as better examples of covenant relationship in our marriages, in our friendships, in our dealings with strangers. Lord, may we reflect you. We thank you so much that you stayed on that cross. So Lord, wherever it is that we may go, may we always cling to that promise. May we be drawn closer to you. Lord, may we learn from your love. May we learn how to express our love for you better and better each and every day. We thank you that it is through your amazing saving grace 
that we have any chance to pull any of that off. So Lord, work in us today to be better reflectors of you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.